on the other end of suffering is a life that many people don't know even exists. It's a beautiful world because we, because like, like the 40% rule, we all live in this world where our brains are keeping us in this box. Outside that box, on the other edge of suffering, which is all the others of that 40%, is a world that's endless of opportunity. But we are afraid to go outside that box because in that box it's comfortable. That's where all of our nice stuff, you know, that's where the nice four lane highway's at. I know where the restrooms are at. I know where the gas stations are at. Outside that box, man, God gives you a shovel and says, man, start digging. That's not fun. But when you dig, you dig your own path to all kinds of stuff that's unknown. And that's why I started realizing, man, like on the other end of this is some beautiful stuff. So I got outside my box and realized, man, 300 pounds. Now look at me, I'm hurting 85 pounds. And on the other side of the box was all this stuff. And I didn't know it was over there until I climbed the wall and saw it. I hated the water, hated the water. And that was about being in that box. If I didn't get over my fear of being, you know, of being in the water, I'd never be a seal. I'm gonna be up here right now. I have no story to share. By me saying, okay, man, I'm afraid of the water. And that's kind of shackling my mind. It's by facing those things. That's how you open up different doors of your life. Because all these things that, that we're afraid of, they're doors that can possibly lead you to a whole other world. But we keep them shut for fear, for insecurities. And that's the thing about tripling down on your weaknesses. So then those weaknesses end up becoming your strengths. No matter what I'm doing or which arena I'm engaging in, I will always aim for greatness because I know that we are all mere mortals and greatness is possible for anyone and everyone if they are willing to seek it out in their own soul. In goggleish terms, greatness is a state of letting go of all your faults and imperfections, scavenging every last bit of strength and energy and putting it to use to excel at whatever you set your mind to. Even if some mother out there told you it was impossible, it is a feeling pursued by those rare souls willing to extend themselves beyond reason and pay the cost. In the late 1950s, Captain Joseph Kittinger was a pilot in the Air Force tapped for experimental aviation and skydiving duty in New Mexico. He wasn't a household name. In fact, Hardly anybody knew the first thing about him until August 16, 1960, when he donned a red duck tape pressure suit and boarded an open-sided gondola tethered to an onion-shaped helium balloon. He flew that rig nearly 20 miles high until he reached the thin atmospheric line where everything goes from blue to black. He traveled to a place where the horizon did not exist. He was above and beyond all previously known limitations. Suspended at 102,800 feet, he unclipped his harness and stepped into space. His free fall lasted nearly five minutes. His maximum velocity was 614 miles per hour. He plummeted over 80,000 vertical feet before his primary chute opened. This was no Red Bull sponsored party. It wasn't a television show. Kittinger wasn't an entertainer. He was an explorer, a seeker of a new realm for the world. His flight and his jump helped make man's space flight possible, and also for himself. I don't jump to Earth from outer space, but I know that atmospheric line between blue and black. It is the glimmer of greatness that runs right through the human soul. We all have it. Most of us will never see it because to get there requires a willingness to extend yourself to the limit without any guarantee of success. Then again, success is just another mile marker on the journey. Landing the jump and walking away while lighting a cigarette as if it were a typical day on the job made Kinder look cool, but it didn't make him great. His willingness to do it in the first place, knowing that the chances of failure were high and everything it cost him made him great. It wasn't a stunt to garner fame or publicity. It was merely an attempt to see what was humanly possible. Just as words can be redefined, never doubt that we can redefine ourselves. It can feel impossible at times because we live in a world filled with arbitrary boundaries and fixed social lines that are as thick as the walls around a fortress. Worse, we allow those walls to limit us in too many ways. 
The brainwashing starts early and it starts at home. The people we grow up with and the environments we grow up in define who we think we are and what we think life is all about. When you're young, you can only know what you see. And if all you are ever exposed to are lazy people, content with mediocrity, or who convince you of your own worthlessness, greatness will remain a fantasy. So this is where the 40% rule comes in, people. Worst shape my entire life. I've been through Ranger School, Delta Force Selection twice, three hell weeks, all this crap. This is the worst pain I've ever been in. To this day, I'm 43 years old right now. I did 21 years in the military. I've done 60 ultra races, pull up records, all kind of stuff. This is the worst pain of my entire life to this day. But this is when I had to realize one thing. I had to break this humongous thing down to very small. All I put in my mind was, let's not quit yet. I'm gonna quit, but not yet. So I sat there, I can't stand up. So let's get some nutrition. All right, I'm not dizzy anymore. Let me clean this crap off me, okay? I need some food. I'm gonna quit after I eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All right, but not yet. Let me see if I can stand up. Stand up, maybe I'll quit. Let me see if I can walk to the car. Hmm, there's the car, it's a one mile track. I'll walk past the car, I'm just gonna get back to the chair. I'm not gonna quit yet. I kept this mindset the whole time. I ended up doing 30 more miles. Did 31 miles, truly, after, after that. I did 101 miles in 19 hours. If you're driving a car, the car may say 130 miles an hour. The factory puts a governor on it, so you only go 91. So you're sitting there when to race somebody. They, they have no governor. They're fine. Boom. You can't. Because every time you get to 91, the car starts doing this. Starts doing this. We put a governor on our brain. And the second we get to that governor, our bodies start doing this. Oh, this sucks. This is uncomfortable. No, 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 no. Let's go this way. Let's stop. It starts giving you all these questions that we cannot answer. If you can't answer the questions your brain is asking you, you quit. If you have the answers to those questions of why the hell am I out here, and you give it a quick answer, the brain starts shutting up because it knows why we're doing what we're doing. I started figuring these things out in my life. So we have this governor on our brain and how you start pushing past that governor, start realizing your brain has the tactical advantage over you. Why? Because it knows your insecurities. It knows when you're lying, it knows your fears, it knows everything about you. And whenever those things start, like right now, I'm scared to death up here. Why? When I was in sixth grade, I was in the play. And I stood up for a whole bunch of white people that probably didn't, you know, I was being judged in my mind. Scared the shit out of me. And I stuttered severely bad. And I knew I stuttered bad. My line was this long. It's like, hello or some shit. <laughs> and I stood up for everybody and I was like this. And I walked off stage. So when I walk up in front of 1,000, 1,200 people, it's still there. My mind's telling me, go, run off the stage. I have to tell my mind something different. I have to remember my resume, what I've been through, that all of you in here are just as f***ed up as me. We post our real life never on Instagram. We post the life that we want to have out there. That's not me anymore. I'm going to tell you exactly about me, who I am. That's how you get better. That's how you fix yourself. That's how you grow. I'm going to move on real quick to the very end of my story. I could be up here for a long time, but I need some questions. I did everything I talked about up here. I ran 205 miles. I ran 7,000 miles in 2007 to raise $2 million for Special Operations Warrior Foundation. I did it all with a hole in my heart, the size of a dime. So basically, I was sick as hell and I didn't get into all of this. Once again, all these stories in my book with all these takeaways that I have that, you know, I'm not a theorist, people. There's a bunch of people who are theorists who go to the library, study the mind. They study it in a book. I studied it by being a practitioner. I put my mind in hell and I realized how I was thinking. And I figured out tools and tactics on how to get through it by being in it, not by studying it, by being in it. And literally that's how I started callousing over. You know how, so I did, what, I did 67,000 pull-ups in nine months and it calloused my hands. It calloused my hands real good to protect my hands against the bar. I started learning how to callous my mind to callous over my victim's mentality. And that's what I did. If you live in the ghetto or in a dying industrial or farming town where buildings are boarded up, addiction runs rampant and the schools are a mess, 
that will factor into the possibilities. Others envision for you and you envision for yourself. But even privileged people can feel shackled by their circumstances. The vast majority of parents don't know what greatness looks like, so they are ill-equipped and afraid to encourage big dreams. They want their children to have security and don't want them to experience failure. That's how limited horizons get passed down from generation to generation. Should we really be surprised that almost everybody has a knack for twisting their story to work against themselves? I hear it all the time. Privileged kids say, I have too much so I cannot develop the skills that you have. The kid that came from nothing will tell me, I don't have enough. Therefore, I cannot develop the skills that you have. No matter where someone is in life, they never fail to confess why they can't get where they need to go. The minute they open their mouths, I see how limited their horizons are and their sob stories come with the expectation that I will deliver a become great package to their front door. But that's not how it works. Identity is a trap that will keep you in blinders if you let it. Sometimes identity is what we are saddled with by society. Other times it's a category we claim. It can be empowering to associate yourself with a particular culture, group, job, or lifestyle, but it can also be limiting. If you stick with your own too closely, you will be susceptible to groupthink, and you may never learn who you really are or what you can accomplish. I know people who were so obsessed with landing a specific job that once they settled into that role, they clipped their own wings. They never moved on or attempted to try anything new, and that blocked them from evolving, developing new skills. Sometimes we are misled by others who categorize us based on what they perceive as our identity. When I met with Navy recruiters, several tried to steer me away from SEAL training and into a different opportunity because I didn't fit the mold. I was overweight. My ASV AB scores were low, and there was my skin color. Remember, I was only the 36th Black Navy SEAL. The recruiters weren't trying to hurt me, and I don't believe they were racist. They honestly thought they were helping me by presenting more realistic options. Usually, however, we mislead ourselves. Those of us who are struggling with our self-worth, like I was as a child, often build identities around the very things that haunt us the most. Not because we want to, but because subconsciously we are convinced that is how everyone else sees us. You cannot allow what someone else may or may not think about you or the issues you're dealing with to stop your progress. My environment and my history made me over anxious and stressed out. The color of my skin made me a mark. I was prejudged and vulnerable at almost every turn and it was my job to defy all of that. No matter how troubled or hopeless or sheltered your environment is, it is your job, your obligation, your duty and your responsibility to yourself to find the blue to black line, that glimmer buried in your soul and seek greatness. Nobody can show you that glimmer. You must do the work to discover it on your own. There are no prerequisites to becoming great. You could be raised by a pack of wolves. You could be homeless and illiterate at 30 years old and graduate from Harvard at 40. You could be one of the most accomplished individuals in the country and still be hungrier and work harder than everybody else you know as you attempt to conquer a new field. And it all starts with a commitment to looking beyond your known world, beyond your street, town, state, or nationality, beyond culture and identity. Only then can true self-exploration begin. After that comes the real work. Fighting those demons every morning and all day long is maddening because they only ever want to break you down. They don't encourage you or make you feel good about yourself or your long odds as you fight through all the toxic mold and crust that is self-hate, doubt, and loneliness. They want to limit you. They want you to surrender and retreat back to what you know. They want you to quit before you get to pliability, where the sacrifice, hard work, and isolation that felt so heavy for so long become your haven where after struggling to visualize greatness for years, it is effortless. That's when momentum will gather like an updraft and send you airborne and spiraling toward the outer limits of your known world. 
It's time to level up and seek out that blue, the black line, the line that separates good from great. It is within each one of us. I believe that we are our own hero. And if you have a culture, let's say right now you guys idolize me and then tomorrow I go outside and I have some kind of issue. We can, I can let you down. I'm human. All your mentors, everybody you like, we're human. You got to put yourself on that pedestal, hold yourself to a higher standard, hold yourself accountable, and then look up to yourself. I'm not saying kiss your own ass, but I'm saying hold yourself to a standard and look inside yourself and try to be the best you can be. We start trying to mimic somebody else. Don't be them, be you. And that's kind of my mindset. Very cool.